Sairam all of you. So, okay, today we are going to speak about our Swami Satyasai Baba. Last few years, um, mostly I make a lot of videos about Premasai, our um, Swami's next incarnation as Premasai. So I'm sharing with a lot of information, uh, concepts, ideas, analytical information. But today, let us speak about Satyasai himself. You know, I came to India for the first time, it was 1993, and uh, um, all 90s and 2000s I uh, spent in put party, and I was lucky enough to be uh, Swami's uh, translator, uh, interpreter for the Russian-speaking groups. Um, actually, it was in the uh, 90s. And I was not only the one who translating uh, for such a sign, but anyway, I was fortunate enough to be one of that uh, maybe three or four interpreters who mainly uh, did this uh, job in, uh, in 90s and the beginning of 2000s. Uh, when we speak about Russian-speaking people, actually some of them are Orthodox Christians and some of them are Sunni Muslims and, uh, well, quite maybe limited number, but even Buddhist. So that's, uh, I think, the beauty of the situation that, um, okay, people who come from Russia, from Kazakhstan, from Ukraine, Belarus, different countries which uh, previously were part of USSR, and, you know, we belong to the different countries right now, and also we belong to the different ethnic groups and religions. But at the same time, uh, people uh, experience experiencing in their heart something special when they mm, just think about our Swami and in that time, yeah, okay, it was possible to uh, enjoy darshans and even interviews. Well, because of um, certain reasons, uh, I mean, uh, Swami always uh, gave a lot of interviews to the Russian-speaking people and because mostly they don't know English and Swami spoke basically English in interview so uh, he was using translators, interpreters like me and two, three more people also uh, were doing this uh, kind of uh, service. Okay, for me it was a huge opportunity, can you imagine just translating for Swami, I mean the main point it was uh, it was a huge chance to get uh, really a lot of interviews and to be with him in the interview room and um, you know uh, when you translating for Swami it was always a chance for me to ask my personal questions but even without questions actually it was just a chance to stay next to him and enjoy his divine presence, his divine, uh, let us say, company. You know, the image of Satya Sai uh, when he was uh, sitting in, on his throne in front of, you know, tens of thousands of people and sometimes even millions of people was like a really great Lord God uh, of the universe uh, who is sitting on that golden throne, etc. But interview time, it was really special experience because um, for that one, one and a half hours, he transformed himself in a kind of, uh, of course, very special, but still friend. You know, it was possible just to speak uh, with him, just to enjoy, um, ask questions, receive answers. Uh, and, um, you know, um, uh, actually I uh, wrote and published in Russian language three books with my memories about uh, all that interviews and I'm planning to translate it actually into English and publish it uh, for the English speaking, for the uh, international, global uh, readership. And um, I mean to say, um, that was really great experience for me to witness how 
uh, Swami was communicating with the people in a very much private uh, atmosphere of his uh, interview room. You know, he was um, behaving and reacting to the people according to the, uh, actually, what was inside that people. I mean, um, I remember, like, uh, sometimes people could come with a long list of uh, intellectual questions. And, of course, in such a case, uh, uh, Swami was never paid attention to uh, such a people, but sometimes people could come um, basically with the very simple questions or even without questions at all, but with the open heart. Actually, it's very easy to retold uh, or to share with uh, certain experiences which are um, about materialization, which are about clear ones, or which are about, okay, some um, spiritual questions and answers. And it's extremely difficult to um, share with uh, um, memories which are about the most subtle experiences. You know, when really, truly devotees uh, come to the interview room without any questions but with the open heart. You know, basically uh, Swami was able to speak um, all languages and we have a lot of uh, witnesses uh, for that. And I myself may witness that number of times he will speak pure Russian language. And it's happened in a different way. Uh, sometimes I could translate, translate something in a wrong way. And then Swami immediately uh, corrected me. And, uh, you know, to his correction, it was absolutely clear that he knows what actually I'm telling, what actually I'm translating. And what was especially amazing that sometimes he was correcting me, okay, in English, just repeat again the sentence which was translated by me in a wrong way. And anyway, that's a clear sign that he, he knows what I was mm, translating. Um, but uh, sometimes, and it was a number of times, just in front of you know other people, and it's not only I, uh, can witness, but many people can witness, he was uh, correcting me in pure Russian language. I mean, for example, uh, if I translated certain um, couple of words or even some, some message in a wrong way, he was able just himself to tell uh, this in pure Russian language with the pure grammar and pronunciation and was kind of shock for the people in the room because, you know, it was, of course, a great happiness to hear how Swami spoke Russian language and, of course, uh, quite funny, you know, what I am actually doing there. I remember, uh, like, in the 90s, uh, quite many people asked me this question, well, if Satisai is able to speak uh, all languages and I know that he spoke uh, all Indian languages and some Western languages and then the question is why he needs a translator or interpreter that was the question which quite many people asked me in, in 90s you know my opinion is if he um, spoke really all languages uh, and if he just really used uh, this uh, ability, uh, then it could be um, so shocking for the people that they may lose um, the meaning of his message. Just imagine if people from Russia, from Germany, from France or from any other country, like from China and Japan, come to the interview room and then Swami, uh, just imagine, yeah, uh, if he he chose to speak like German, French, Chinese, and Japanese, you know, 
what is my feeling is that in this case people will lose concentration on the meaning of the message and they will concentrate um, especially on the miracle itself uh, so that's the reason why I believe he spoke basically English and with the help of uh, interpreter um, just to make people concentrate uh, on the meaning of his words but not on the miracle of, you know, speaking all languages. Uh, of course, interview time, it was, um, well, time for the miracles of materialization. And uh, I uh, may say that it was a huge difference between how Swami materialized uh, all that rings and Japa Mala and other objects, you know, outside of uh, interview room and inside uh, interview room. And the difference was that uh, sometimes inside um, interview room, uh, okay, as actually I'm sure you uh, you remember that all the materialization uh, took place from his uh, right hand and um, uh, sometimes certain light uh, could appear from the center of his uh, a hand and um, then from this uh, light uh, all the rings and Japa Malas or any statues of different gods could um, appear or be materialized. So it means sometimes it was first light and then only uh, all the objects. Sometimes the uh, miracle of materialization uh, was uh, together with sound effect. It's like electrical uh, kind of sound and then after this sound, uh, whatever rings, uh, japa malas or statues, small idols of the different Vedic gods could appear in a Swami's hand. And I remember a number of interesting stories which happened with uh, uh, other people, uh, Russian-speaking people who uh, were kind of translators at that time and sometimes uh, interpreters or just people with a really good English could just forget English for that <clears throat> uh, interview time and sometimes people uh, without knowledge of the English language could really play uh, the, this role of uh, translator absolutely perfectly and I remember one lady, basically Russian-speaking lady from New York, she came to put party and one group asked her to be an uh, interpreter and you know she came to the interview room and for one and a half hours just forgot English and then uh, the knowledge of the English came back I mean um, you know after interview and uh, another lady from Petersburg uh, from Russia she was absolutely you know with a zero language knowledge but when she came with her group to the interview room something happened with her and for one and a half hours of the interview time she was perfect translator with a perfect um, knowledge of English and then she went out of the room and oh my god like a knowledge of the language left her that's how Swami Kul showed to us that you know, people's mind is just absolutely under his control. Um, you know, sometimes people asked him uh, to initiate or to bless them uh, with a mantra. And his reaction was always personal. Uh, of course, we know that um, in the end of his uh, uh, life uh, Swami actually blessed all devotees uh, from 
all parts of the world to chant um, Vedic uh, hymns uh, like Namakam, Chamakam, etc., Narayana Upanishad as well. But in the 90s, it was not uh, really like that. And when people asked him uh, for the blessing, for the mantra, uh, you know, his reaction was very personal. And sometimes he could really bless people and sometimes uh, deny the necessity uh, of the Sanskrit mantra japa at all. You know, at that time in the 90s, I was really um, uh, learning Sanskrit in the Moscow State University and in Rishikesh also quite short period of time and for me mantra japa was really something um, outstanding i was just really my favorite kind of sadhana and i was very happy when people uh, were trying to get to receive all that blessings i was you know, uh, always interesting okay what swami will tell this time and he was very personal and uh, for, to those people to whom it was really a spiritually beneficial to practice mantra in Sanskrit, he was easily um, to bless people uh, uh, to practice Gayatri mantra or any, like, um, any other mantra. Uh, and uh, sometimes he could point to the benefits to practice their own uh, so-called family tradition and uh, okay uh, mostly people in Russia are um, Orthodox Christians or uh, Sunni Muslims and uh, uh, quite often Swami um, could um, advise to the people pay attention to the family religious tradition and that was also absolutely wonderful. You know, his sense of humor was amazing. And I remember like uh, once he told to me and a friend of mine uh, that, you know, in such a way like, you know, oh, boys, uh, it's really strange that people are, um, uh, can't materialize things. Basically, it's so easy. And you know, for me, it was a huge shock and surprise to hear from Swami such strange words. And I immediately told him, you know, uh, Bhagavan, um, maybe it's very easy to materialize things for you, but not for us, where we can't do this. Um, and he told us, okay, come on, boys, don't worry about it, I'll teach you. You know, the next moment he told, oh, come on, boys, just concentrate here in the middle of your uh, hand and, uh, you know, just concentrate, keep on concentrating there, imagine something and, okay, well, 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 just materialize. And it was really funny game because, of course, we could not materialize anything, but he really materialized uh, for my friend a wonderful ring. But after that, uh, Swami gave us wonderful spiritual instruction. Actually, he told that, you know, boys, um, actually people materialize with their thoughts and emotions much greater things than rings because actually people materialize their own life with the power of thoughts and emotions. That was a really huge instruction. And you know, he started um, all that with a kind of juice. You know, can you imagine uh, Swami was trying to teach uh, me and a friend of mine how to materialize rings. It was a wonderful joke. But the end of this um, conversation was very serious about uh, the fact that um, our thoughts uh, actually creating something greater than rings. They create our life and all conditions of our life. You know, it's a very questionable uh, thing. Uh, is it spiritual uh, to create goals? 
And uh, of course, it's a very personal choice and a very personal, um, I may say, even spiritual um, pathway to God. Uh, and you know, some people really, um, really work seriously with the system of goals. You know, it's many people like to do all that kinds of uh, things like to set goals, clear goals. And some spiritual practitioners, they say that, okay, to have goals means to have desires and that's not really spiritual enough. Okay, um, well, um, maybe it's my personal experience, but uh, anyway, my job is to share with my personal experiences without trying to put it as something absolute, uh, you know, something like absolute truth or um, the, the kind of things. Um, but anyway, my personal experience with uh, Swami is that he was uh, pointing uh, to the importance of uh, having, um, creating set of clear goals and to many of um, people for whom I um, actually was translating in 90s he really told that you have uh, to have um, clear goals because if you don't have clear priorities, clear goals in your life, then you can't uh, really achieve anything in this life and you can't really be helpful. You know, it's very interesting. Sometimes we consider um, this uh, idea to have a clear set of goals as something like egoistic but really speaking it's not um, always like that because goals can be creative goals can be spiritual and goals can be based on your uh, life purpose you know i think that different people we have different picture of Swami actually because uh, each and everyone has his or her own um, okay image or um, picture of Swami and according to what is my personal experience I think that um, so he was uh, repeating uh, quite many times to the different people in my presence so that's the reason why I can witness this that clarity of uh, mind about your goals and priorities <clears throat> it's extremely essential and important for the spiritual creative life and just important that um, all that set of goals must be based on uh, uh, of course uh, such a things like your life purpose and your service to the people Okay, I think in the future I'll make more and more videos with uh, my memories about uh, interviews with the Swami and um, let me complete this video for today. Sairam, God bless you. Uh, see you next time.